The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and good afternoon to all who are joining from India and a very good morning to all joining from Germany. I am Mona Desai Tanshe from the Indo-German Chamber of Commerce and it is my pleasure to introduce you to all our very esteemed knowledge partners and panelists today. Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas. This year they complete 103 years and have advised a large and varied clientele base, including domestic and foreign commercial enterprises. Cyril Amarchand is India's leading top tier full service law firm with over 750 fee earners, including 138 partners across its offices in Mumbai, Delhi, Bengaluru, Ahmedabad, Chennai, and Hyderabad. They are India's first law firm to adopt an AI technology. They foster innovation and learning for the corporate and legal landscape through its initiatives like Praram, a legal tech incubator, and Gurukul, a first of its kind client university model in India. And something very important to note for all our German companies who are here with us, Cyril Amarchand have a dedicated German desk in India, and they've had an extensive experience of advising companies in the Indo-German corridor. Moving on to our panelists for today, ladies and gentlemen, combined, three of them have six decades of experience and know-how and are in the truest sense stalwarts in their field. It is my privilege to introduce you to our first panelist, Ms. Akila Agarwal, partner, head murders, mer mergers and acquisitions. Akila has over 20 years of experience in matters pertaining to mergers and acquisitions, joint ventures, corporate restructuring, general corporate and employment law. She has handled acquisitions, disposals, takeovers, delisting offers, commercial contracts, and SEBI-related matters with a considerable national and international experience. She has been consistently ranked for corporate mergers and acquisitions in Chambers Global and Chambers Asia Pacific for several years. Asia Law Leading Lawyers 2021 features Akila as a distinguished practitioner for corporate M&A. Who's Who Legal 2020 names her as a global leader in, in M&A and governance. She is named as a notable practitioner for corporate M&A and private equity in IFLR 1000. Akila, we welcome you today. Our second speaker, Ms. Rashmi Pradeep, partner, Rashmi heads the employment law practice of Cyril Amarchand and advises on a wide spectrum of employment law issues ranging from those relating to the day-to-day -day functioning of a business to a large complex transactions involving acquisitions of businesses with a large employee base. She advises on retrenchment and downsizing of the workforce, strategizing on management of unions and closure of establishments. Rashmi also advises boards of large companies on complex government issues and shareholder disputes. She has been in practice for over 17 years and has been recognized by chambers and partners and also ranked by Legal 500 for labor and employment in India. Rashmi, we are very happy to have you today here with us. And finally, our third panelist, Ashwin Stapra, partner. Ashwin is a partner in the firm's corporate practice and is a subject matter specialist in the areas of pharmaceuticals, medical device regulatory, compliance, and patent law. He brings extensive domestic and international experience, which spans over a period of 20 years. Ashwin routinely advises clients in the pharmaceutical, healthcare, and life science sector on regulatory compliance and patent issues arising out of regular business operations and complex transactions. I welcome you all, dear panelists, and ladies and gentlemen, I am both anxious and excited for today's session as we have some great speakers to address us here today. I wish you all a great session and request our audience to please put clear questions in our chat box. We will take questions at the end of the session. In case we are unable to take them live, someone from the Cyril Amarchand team will definitely get back to you offline. Thank you. And Akila, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Monas. Uh, thank you, uh, Indo-German Chamber of Commerce, for giving us this opportunity to interact with your members. Uh, we uh, have something for, planned for one hour. 
the topic as you know is uh, doing business in india and navigating the new normal so the last six months uh, all of you must have seen so much change the change has been unprecedented i don't think any of us in our careers have seen something like this or claim to have seen something like this uh, we uh, from the legal side have been working with several clients uh, and we have had a ring fence uh, or a ringside view on several of their problems and concerns so the idea today is to share them with you uh, under different buckets uh, the some of the biggest concerns our clients face is that uh, either they have reduced revenue or nil revenue so they want to raise funds they want to raise funds by equity by debt uh, or by selling off some of their non core assets uh, others may have supply chain issues in terms of their contracts or honoring of those contracts uh, there are clients who have seen a huge uptick in their business if they are say in a technology uh, sector or in e-commerce uh, or uh, similar uh, growth uh, sector in, in these pandemic times and they are grappling with how to grow inorganically, how to acquire companies in these remote settings and what kind of safeguards they should take. Uh, we also have um, seen clients grappling with the whole employment uh, aspect of this pandemic, the whole remote working, working from home, how to motivate your employees, comply with the uh, laws which keep changing uh, quite rapidly uh, to keep up with the times. So these are some of the concerns that we have uh, seen in the past. Uh, the idea is that Rashmi, Ashwin and I uh, hope to talk to you for the next one hour. Uh, we have divided it into two um, buckets, so to speak, based on our individual expertise. I will talk about corporate law and the deal space as such. Rashmi on employment and uh, Ashwin on uh, the environment aspect. We are not specifically going into any sector specific aspects. Maybe that could be a topic for a separate webinar. So we're trying to keep it generic for all corporates so that it will be useful for the uh, for most participants who are uh, with us today. So uh, moving to the first topic on uh, corporate law, uh, some of the things that uh, you know may be of significance or uh, use to you is to understand what has changed in the last six months in terms of generally operating your business from a corporate law perspective. Uh, and um, so I would like to uh, talk to you about that in three um, three segments. One is a lot has changed, uh, obviously, procedurally. So most of the changes that you've seen in the past six months in terms of uh, government intervention or, uh, you know, circulars and notifications and the like, uh, there has been a lot of procedural change, whether in terms of, you know, giving you more time to hold your AGM or, um, uh, you know, enabling you to do your AGMs through, say, a video conference or um, uh, an audio visual uh, kind of a device. Uh, there are there has been uh, extension of the moratorium on insolvency proceedings which gives corporate borrowers more time to deal with the current stress and not be saddled with fresh insolvency proceedings against them so the procedural changes have all been enablers uh, we did not see any um, issue with most of these changes because uh, most regulators whether by giving more time or making things more flexible have only enabled businesses in this aspect in fact, the uh, MCA has uh, even gone about amending the Companies Act, decriminalizing several of the offenses which earlier used to have imprisonment and other uh, kind of penalties, which are now kind of uh, there's a more lenient approach to some of the technical uh, non-compliance with the Companies Act. So keeping the procedural changes aside uh, and looking at the substantive ones, uh, we've seen some very important substantive changes that have been introduced um, in this period of the last six months after the after the pandemic has started. One of the key changes relates to Press Note 3. Uh, so this is relevant for people who are investing into India. And it's also relevant for people who are trying to sell off uh, shares uh, or their existing investments in India. So the Press Note 3 originally uh, was introduced to avoid uh, Indian companies being taken over by foreign um, foreigners or any foreign companies uh, from certain undesirable countries uh, at very depressed values. But as the, as the time progressed, it is now more of a national security kind of uh, press note due to our border tensions with China. What the press note says is that if uh, if you are uh, an investor from a country which shares land border with India 
or if you have a beneficial owner from this from these countries then before you invest in india you need to get an approval from the government and this approval may or may not be forthcoming because it also involves a national security clearance from by the home home minister home ministry so uh, this obviously has changed a lot in terms of uh, our existing uh, deals uh, in terms of uh, not just companies that are incorporated or have substantial stakeholding in china but also private equity funds who uh, are operating say out of uh, hong kong or who have investment managers in hong kong and the like because the notification has no limitation in terms of sector it is applicable to every kind of investment whether it is manufacturing or defense it also does not have any threshold so it doesn't matter if you have 1% chinese shareholding or 10% chinese shareholding so what has happened is that though those though those amendments to the fema itself are fairly strict uh, a practice has developed um, from the guidance of the authorized dealers where up to 25% of chinese uh, investment is considered all right based on guidance from past interpretations of what is a beneficial interest so today uh, deals have happened uh, where uh, say indirect chinese interest is say 10% or 15% so it depends on the authorized dealer who is routing this foreign direct investment into india uh, and so though the law is very strict so if you ask a lawyer for an opinion you may not get a very unqualified opinion the practice has moved that uh, moved to attend to uh, 25% chinese um, uh, chinese uh, interest beneficial interest is is all right uh, subject to other facts and circumstances so that is one important change which which is very important and even if you are a seller Uh, we have seen in several instances uh, if you look at most uh, sale transactions that happen nowadays those are happening through bids and auction methods uh, so if one of the bidders is from any of these countries then the seller would kind of give a different weightage to such a bidder because it involves a regulatory approval and there is still some level of uncertainty as to whether this approval will be forthcoming uh the second big substantive change i would like to highlight deals with um government uh, procurement or public procurement so you know, if you look at um if you look at our um uh, public procurement policy the government introduced maybe a month after this press note 3 introduction that any uh, person who bids for tenders uh, floated by the government which includes public sector companies like say ongc or oil and the like and if they are from this these countries whether directly or indirectly then they're not allowed to participate in such tenders without a registration now the registration has to be done with dpiit and uh, though the registration process has started uh, we're not aware of uh, any any company getting registered and being able to participate in such tenders and uh, this again is has impacted uh, some some of our clients and some some business businesses because they may not be originally from china but they may have uh invested through say hong kong when hong kong was not even part of china but they could get embroiled in this particular uh, prohibition so this is something uh, of of note um the third change that i would want to highlight is relating to the ability of stressed companies to fund or raise funds uh, in these times so uh, the the capital markets regulator that is sebi has recognized that you know it is difficult for the promoter to pump in more funds in these times and therefore they have kind of relaxed the ability of listed companies who are stressed there is a definition of who is stressed so if you meet those definitions and if you are a stressed company then you can uh, you know raise funds preferentially through say an institution or uh, any third party uh where the pricing is more liberal than what it would have been otherwise and the person who is investing can will also not trigger the takeover regulations in certain circumstances so these um, these a couple of changes that have been made to our uh, uh listing uh, listing related laws whether it is icdr or uh, the takeover regulations have enabled some of the stressed listed companies to kind of you know uh, avoid the stress by getting in some funds at a more competitive kind of pricing because the historical pricing may not hold good anymore so these are the three uh, you know substantive points that i wanted to highlight there are certain other changes also of note uh, some stuff has changed with fcra uh, in terms of csr uh, you you need to uh, take note of that for example earlier uh, companies used to have one agency 
through whom they did all this csr and that company used to uh, thereafter transfer their funds to another eligible ngo but that kind of transferring is now no longer permitted so most companies now have to directly provide the funds to the implementing ngo so uh, these are some of the changes which have been done some of them are facilitating in nature some of them are uh, more in forms of a check to avoid uh, or to rather um, you know promote more sustained development and self reliance uh, within our country so these are something that uh, which uh, which i thought i should share with you uh, the third aspect that i would like to share with you is the practice itself so uh, you know in terms of deal making or the kind of corporate transactions that we have seen uh, whether it's a merger or an acquisition transaction or a joint venture um, whether those things have changed because of the pandemic or not um, a lot is the same what we have been doing earlier a lot is is, is very much what we, uh, you know we continue to do but a lot has changed uh, and some of the key changes are in terms of firstly the due diligence uh, so now our due diligence from a legal perspective our very checklist has changed uh, the time taken has changed uh, there is more emphasis on contracts material contracts your uh, rely, your rely, reliance or your dependence on certain uh, suppliers or customers uh, the whole employment um, uh, diligence has changed because the past 6 months different companies have done different kind of things in terms of how they have grappled with the situation in covid and also the um, audited balance sheet say uh, which may be available by end of march uh, may not be um, may not be the uh, may not really reflect the true true worth or the true nature of the company on ground so all of this has um, you know um, changed the way we as lawyers do our diligence it's taking us more time uh, more engagement with the uh, financial advisors on this uh, the second important change uh, as far as um, we can tell is the risk allocation so there have been deals where we used to have a lockbox kind of an arrangement where we fix a price we expect to close the transaction in a couple of months we really don't do much adjustments because not nothing much is frankly going to change between signing and closing those days are over there is a lot of uncertainty between signing and closing so there is a, a much uh, nuanced uh, engagement and um, negotiations around how the price is going to be adjusted even though it is agreed on a certain uh, time as of signing so whether it is the seller who wants an upside because he believes the price is depressed and it is a temporary phenomenon or the buyer who wants a downside protection because he believes that things could go worse uh, one never knows so from both aspects there is a lot of discussions on how to adjust the final price as and when the buyer takes over the risk of the particular business similarly uh, uh, there is also a change on what is a standstill between uh, signing and closing the preference of course is to keep the time between signing and closing as limited as possible but sometimes it's not it's, you can't do it because you may be requiring some approval say from the competition authorities or something like that so when there is a time gap what is the is the order of business in terms of ordinary course has completely changed for example if you look at um, the recent um, uh, recent acquisition that louis vuitton had to do in uh, of tiffany uh, and which they have now uh, reneged on and they want to repudiate it the one of the grounds on which they want to repudiate is because uh, tiffany was acting in the ordinary course so even though there was a pandemic they continued to pay rent as if nothing happened uh, so that's one of the claims so what is ordinary cause has kind of changed now so you know what is ordinary cause pre pandemic may not be prudent post pandemic and so there is a much more elaborate definition of such kind of very standard boilerplate terms like ordinary cause or material adverse effect and the like so this is broadly what we have seen uh, in terms of uh, deal making and uh, the general corporate uh, perspective now i will uh, move to, uh, to uh, and i'll request my uh, fellow partner uh, rashmi uh, to step in so rashmi uh, heads our employment uh, employment team as uh, monas introduced uh, so rashmi the, one of the things that we wanted to discuss with you is uh, what what do you think are the key developments in terms of labor and employment in the past 6 months yeah thank you akila and good afternoon and good morning to everyone on the session. Uh, so the past six months has actually seen a complete overhaul of the labor regime in India. Uh, to just set some context, um, most of our labor legislations were enacted during that period from 1947 immediately after getting independence to 1980. And for the next 40 years, 
we've had only about a handful of legislations in the labor and uh, employment sphere. Uh, and then since April of this year, we've seen large scale changes. And if I were to kind of bucket them, I would say there were specific changes in the labor and employment regime in relation or as a, as a result of the entire COVID crisis. And there's also the codification exercise that has been in uh, the pipeline for some time, but we kind of saw it actually uh, play out and you know get proper formal shape in the past month or so. So if I look at the COVID related changes, um, if, uh, if you recall, uh, the country went down into a lockdown uh, end March. And simultaneously with this, we saw both the state and the center government exercising powers to immediately protect workers who they believed would be the first, uh, you know, um, first uh, um, uh, uh, set of stakeholders who would be affected by the pandemic and the ensuing lockdowns. So you had the state and the central government um, issuing uh, specific notifications, advisories, etc., urging employers not to terminate employees during the lockdown and also to ensure that full um, salary and wages was paid during this period, so as to ensure uh, that uh, you know the immediate fallout of the lockdown was uh, not on the workers and employees. Uh, thereafter, you had states acting uh, under the Epidemic Diseases Act, which is a 100-year-old legislation which hasn't been called into uh, play over the last uh, more than 100 years. And you had the center acting under the Disaster Management Act, uh, which again set out specific guidelines on how uh, and what uh, you could and could not do during this period in order to control the pandemic. So you could not have your offices open. There was restrictions on uh, movement of goods or movement of employees. And uh, thereafter, even when the lockdown started easing out, you had specific SOPs that had to be complied with. And even today, I have to continue to be complied with to ensure that uh, the spread of the disease is uh, you know, controlled. Uh, in terms of um, specific employer-employee relations, I think the first most uh, noted uh, uh, notification that came out during this period was the MHA notification uh, in end March. It specifically provided that in the event um, uh, you know, because of the lockdown, if there was any uh, proposal by any employer to either terminate employees or reduce wages, that could not be done uh, as long as the lockdown was effective. Um, that MHA notification was um, in place for a period uh, up to May 18th. Thereafter, it ceased to have effect. However, a lot of employers found themselves in breach of that notification and uh, many employers approached the Supreme Court. Uh, the matter is still before the Supreme Court, so the Supreme Court has specifically said that no coercive action is to be taken against any erring employer uh, for, the, for their conduct during that period. Uh, many employers unfortunately found themselves in a situation while uh, you know there was no revenue, there was no uh, no business happening, and therefore they were unable to pay salaries and keep people in employment. So many employers had to take tough tough decisions during that initial period. Um, so the, so the first bucket of changes during COVID uh, the COVID uh, you know uh, lockdown and ensuing um, um, ensuing period was the fact that these notifications sought to protect employees. Thereafter, you had the government coming out with a whole spew of beneficial steps to protect both employers and employees and provide some relief. And you saw that in terms of uh, relaxations, um, in terms of social security benefits that had to be paid, the government took on the burden in certain instances. So for example, employee provident fund contributions are contributions that have to be made on a monthly basis, both on behalf of the employer and employee. These contributions, there was a three month uh, you know, uh, period during which these contributions were reduced from 12% to 10% in certain establishments which had less than 100 employees um, and of which 90% earned less than 15,000 rupees a month. The government took on the obligation of both employer and employee. There was waiver generally of any late uh, payment fees, penalties or interest in the event that any of these social security contributions were paid late. So that was the second bucket of reliefs that came during the COVID-19 uh, period. And then you had uh, the third phase, which is still ongoing right now, is where the states have stepped in and the states have, uh, you know, um, uh, given the powers that they have under the Constitution of India, um, taking measures to ensure that they are uh, that employers or the burden on employers uh, because of the ensuing uh, lockdown and the resultant economic effects of it are in some way eased. So, for example, under the Factories Act, compliances 
um, have been eased out. The number, uh, the threshold number for factories. So for example, previously, uh, if you had 20 or more employees, you had to comply with uh, the Factories Act regulations. That in many states has been increased to 50. Uh, similarly, under the Contract Labor Act, the limit has moved up to 50 as opposed to 20, which it was previously. Um, so many uh, such relaxations have also come from various state governments. Some of these relaxations, including for overtime payable, um, on uh, you know the number of days of leaves they have to get, the number of days of uh, the number of hours that they can work in a day. Those relaxations, some of them have been challenged. Uh, by uh, by many unions uh, before various high courts. Some of those are pending, so we'll have to see how that goes. Uh, in the state of Gujarat, for example, some of these relaxations have been struck down as being, um, you know, contrary to the uh, constitutional provisions. And uh, we'll have to see whether some of these other changes do actually get upheld in a court of law or not. But currently, there are many relaxations which employers are able to take the benefit of. Um, moving to the second set of developments over the past uh, seven months, I think all of you are probably aware, which is the large scale codification of labor laws that has happened. Um, we've had, um, India works under federal uh, federal system of government, which basically means both the center and the state, um, you know, have the power to legislate on certain subjects which are under their legislative spheres. Now you have labor and employment actually falling under what is called the concurrent list of the constitution of India, which basically means both the center and the state can legislate on labor and employment matters. Uh, what this has given rise to is that uh, historically we've had more than 40 central legislations and over 100 state legislations and this has always been an issue with uh, you know um, uh, with employers in the country with people wanting to come into india and do business in india is to say that the the nature of compliances and the nature of laws that they have to comply with and the number of laws that they have to comply with in the labor and employment sphere is just very very high and really uh, hampers uh, the ease of doing business in India. And it is um, in this light that the government has recently pushed to codify laws to bring it under uh, four main codes. So there's been a push to um, uh, do that over the past 16 odd years. And finally, in the past two years, we've seen some results of that. Last year, we had the wage code that came out. The wage code um, uh, consolidated four main legislations related in relation to wages uh, payable to, uh, to employees. And then this year, in late September, we had the other three codes also being passed by both houses of parliament and it has also received presidential assent. Uh, those codes are the social security code, uh, you have the industrial relations code, and you have the occupational safety and health code, also known as the OSH code. Uh, these are the three new codes that have come into play. Now, all of these codes have passed, been passed by parliament. Uh, they've received presidential assent, but we are still awaiting the date of notification. Uh, before the codes can come into effect, uh, the, all of the governments, both the state and the center, have specific um, tasks that they have to undertake. They have to draft rules in relation to various aspects of these codes. And it's only after that uh, that we can expect the date of notification uh, to be, uh, to be um, you know, announced. Uh, the expectation right now, at least from what we're hearing from the government, is that this will happen, uh, at least the draft rules should be out by December, and the expectation is that by next April we will have these codes in effect, and all employers across the country will have to begin to comply with them. Okay. So I can, I can sense a lot of uh, anxious awaital on your part to get these labor codes notified. I'm sure it makes your life simpler in terms of advising on, on advising on this multitude of legislations so what are the three uh, kind of takeaways as an employer that you know one should know on the labor courts based on the draft labor courts no. um so um so just again to just set some context what the labor courts essentially have done is they have uh, collated 29 uh, central labor legislations into four courts uh, what was an, one of the biggest concerns in the earlier regime or the regime that we're still following today until the labor codes come into play is that each of these legislation had differing definition of who an employee was, who an employer was, what was wages or salary. Um, and this had caused a lot of concern because if you are an employer and you had to pay your employees, uh, say, provident fund contributions, you had to ensure minimum wage was paid, you had to ensure that uh, you know, gratuity is paid under the Payment of Gratuity Act. 
all of these amounts are calculated on what is called wages or salary under each legislation but every single legislation had a different definition of what wage or salary was and this was further compounded by the fact that you know the courts had also interpreted it at various points of time to include certain allowances etc which traditionally maybe you would not have included uh, so this has caused a lot of confusion and one of the first things that the labor courts tries to address is to bring about uniformity in definitions and i think the three key definitions would be the def definition of wages the de definition of employer and the definition of employee um i think the essential part about the definition of wages is that they have said that even if you do have allowances so you, the wages is defined as uh, your basic wage uh, and if you do have allowances any amount of those allowances which exceed 50% of the total wage would be you know counted back into the definition of wages so you can't uh, put in allowances which would normally be excluded and assume that the base on which you need to calculate social security contributions or other payments would be brought down so they've kind of tried to pin uh, you know plug that hole by saying that anything any allowances in addition to 50% of the total wage would be uh, you know brought back into the ambit of what wages would be so that is one of the key changes um the other is the definition of employer and employee uh, i think from an employee perspective uh, most of our labor legislations protected only our blue collar and you know uh, employees uh, below a certain uh, category it specifically excluded managerial and supervisory employees that is no longer the case uh, managerial and supervisory employees have also brought within the ambit of certain sections of the labor codes uh and from an employer perspective as well they've expanded the definition of employer uh and this is something that the industry has been asking for is to also include uh, contractors into the definition of employer so if you are uh, you know employing a lot of contract labor uh, then uh, if the contractor has proper arrangements with the contract labor proper employment agreements is discharging social security contributions etc to those employees then the contractor becomes the employer and uh, that's you know, we expect that that will give uh, principal employers some sense of relief so i think the one of the main key uh, changes has been uh, the the uniformity of def definitions across uh, the various codes um there's also been a significant reduction in the number of uh, registrations to be obtained otherwise under each of these 29 reg uh, legislations you had to get 29 separate registrations now that of course has been brought down to four because every code requires you to just get one registration and uh, that will obviously ease the compliance burden on uh, on employers um the focus of the codes has also been on compliance right now as opposed to punishment so there is a whole system of an inspector cum facilitator regime uh, earlier it was only an inspection regime and the facilitator regime i think has been welcomed by all employers because there is an expectation that the facilitator will uh, ensure that uh, you know employers are sensitized to the compliance requirements under the new codes and only after they're given an opportunity to actually uh, comply will uh, you know any kind of adverse be action be taken in the event of breach so there's going to be a much more friendlier regime to operate under and uh, i think lastly uh, there's also been a move to um, you know increase um, so previously all of our employment laws only covered what is known as the organized sector of our labor of our labor force uh, right now there is a move to also uh, increase or expand that scope and bring in our unorganized workforce as well and you specifically have the social security code bringing in the unorganized sector and specifically the gig workers or the platform workers as Uh, you know uh, they are commonly referred to under the social security net as well we'll have to see how it plays out and uh, you know whether they truly will uh, uh, give, give them some relief or not but uh, this is broadly the framework uh, of the labor codes no i think i think that helps i think uh, the bottom line is that it really simplifies stuff and makes it easier to comply with the uh, numerous legislations so so you mentioned uh, gig workers uh and we read a lot about the gig economy which seems to be the flavor of the pandemic season so how is it any different from uh, what we already know about say a contract labor arrangement or a fixed term employment uh that that has been there for a while yeah so yeah i think gig workers and platform workers is a new concept it's kind of emerged as a as a you know as a result of a lot of regulation happening on contract labor and fixed term employees so let me just explain uh, contract labor arrangements are essentially where personnel are engaged through third third party contractor 
it's uh, very often for uh, you know services like housekeeping security etc and sometimes to augment manpower requirements so that's what a contract labor arrangement is it's normally through a registered third party contractor fixed term employees on the other hand are directly engaged by the employer but you have fixed term contracts uh, benefits are contractually negotiated and i think the biggest advantage of a fixed term employment agreement is that when the fixed term period is over then the contract just expires and the employer does not have any obligation to pay any kind of uh, severance compensation which would otherwise have been payable under law if they were terminated so that's broadly what contract labor and fixed term employees are gig workers on the other hand are actually outside of this employer employee framework uh, they are not directly they are not engaged through contractors and their direct engagement is more like a service provider as opposed to an employer employee relationship and um, if you see uh, the way most of these gig uh, relationships are um, you know are uh, are uh, structured they are very often uh, done in a way that these gig workers can work for multiple employers at the same time um, they uh, you know you 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 i think nearly everyone would have at some point come across uh, gig workers in their day to day life whether it's an uber driver or you know a swiggy uh, delivery person for your food uh, there's been a lot of global jurisprudence on gig workers as well uh, both uh, in the united states and in the eu region and even in australia uh, gig workers have um, historically over the past 5 6 years been making claims that actually the relationship is in the nature of an employer employee relationship and actually asking for employment benefits and even in india today uh, there is a case that's been filed by the uber and ola drivers in the delhi high court are uh, making a similar claim uh, that they are actually employees of uh, these platform or uh, platform uh, companies uh, whether it's uber ola and the kind of relationship or the kind of um, uh, you know power that these a uh, companies actually exercise on these workers is that of an employer now of course that matter still being heard uh, but i think what is interesting to note under the current uh, so social security code is that they have actually defined gig and, pla and platform workers and this has never been done previously um and even under the uh, labor legislation in india in the under the labor code they actually recognize them as a relationship outside of the traditional employer employee relationship so they actually i think define the define both these as a person who performs work or participates in a work arrangement and earns from such activities outside of a traditional employer employee relationship and i think that's an, a very important point to note it, it is in some sense giving them a recognition for certain social security benefits and hoping that by recognizing them and providing them with some of these benefits uh, they will you know stop making claims of employer employment relationship um, we'll have to see how that plays out i think it will really depend a lot on what the government does for this group um if you look at the social security code uh, currently it enables the central government to make a scheme to ensure that they are covered it uh, imposes certain obligations on the aggregators uh, which is you know uh, any of these companies that's engaging gig workers to make certain contributions towards that social security regime uh, but right now it is only a may it is not a compulsory requirement so we'll have to see how um, how it finally plays out uh, and to see whether it really brings down the risk of uh, some of these workers claiming uh, or making a claim for regularization of employment sure sure i think i think that that's very interesting it appears there's a thin line between gig yeah. workers and normal employees one needs to be careful about uh, i know we are running out of time on the employment segment so but i'll ask one quick question to you rashmi so yeah. i understand a lot of companies are modifying their policies uh, to you know uh, take care of the work from home situation uh, can you just highlight some of the key things that they are doing yeah sure so i think um it looks like we're going to be working from home a lot longer than it's initially expected and many companies are modifying their hr policies i think there are two main reasons they're doing it one is to account for change in administrative processes and the other is to account for potential change in employee behavior so if you look at it um uh, many of the employees are not now uh, taking leave so you have a huge leave balance uh, kind of uh, building up and a lot of employers are trying to now enforce uh you know mandatory leave requirements to ensure that this is brought down because otherwise employers are left with a large liability on their books um they're also changing uh, systems in terms of how overtime hours are recorded logging in and logging out uh you know access card earlier you had access cards and reading uh reading biometric systems that did this for you but now you're going to have to do it through technology uh from the you know uh, from the remote workplace 
Uh, we're also, um, you know, seeing a lot of employers putting in place specific work from home policies, which very clearly define what is, uh, you know, permitted and prohibited conduct at the at the work from home environment. Uh, there's a lot of work being also done on electronic signatures and how to get employee consent in specific situations and uh, what is the best way to document and record uh, record some of these consents. Uh, some of the behavioral changes that uh, are also, you know, uh, requiring some kind of policing through policies, I think is a um, lot of new types of employee misconducts that are coming up, whether it's availability during working hours, the manner in which you dress for video calls, uh, there's new types of sexual harassment claims that are coming up, so a lot of training sessions happening uh, to ensure that employees are sensitized on what is appropriate conduct and what is not. Uh, there's a, also a lot of um, internal process changes that are happening because now a lot of investigations and disciplinary hearings are happening online uh, or through virtual uh, virtual mediums. So to ensure that processes are clearly documented and uh, you know all of this is properly done to ensure that going forward, if any of this is challenged, you're able to produce uh, proper uh, you know records of having completed due process. So I think these are broadly some of the changes that we're seeing from a work from home uh, situation and um, happy to take, yeah, I guess, some specific questions later if required, Akila. I think we can take the questions yeah. off. Uh, yeah. uh, going to the next topic on environmental law. So we have with us Ashwin who leads our environmental law initiatives. Uh, so Ashwin, uh, I understand that there is a new environmental impact assessment norms in a draft form. Uh, so what is your take on that? Does it make it easier for business houses or is, does it make things more difficult to operate a plant or, you know, comments and start operations? What is your take on that in generally? Sure. Uh, thanks, Akila. And uh, hello, everybody. Uh, glad to be here. So you see the, the new environment assessment norms that have that have been really uh, released. Uh, obviously, they are currently in draft mode, but they sort of give an indication of, of, of where the government is headed. What is the thought process of the government? And I think one of the biggest takeaways is that the government has has sort of reduced the the burden on 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 investors on players in the industry in terms of regulatory administrative reporting requirements are concerned. I think uh, they are cognizant of the the issues that are being faced by uh, the industry when it actually comes to obtaining environmental clearances. They've tried to reduce all the the red tape that was there, which is one of the main concern um, that was there of, of, of uh, industry players. Uh, one of the other things that they've done is also that they've tried to reduce the timelines that are there, uh, that are required for getting these clearances, uh, because there was, that was a major gripe of uh, for a lot of lot of uh, investors that, uh, that these clearances were taking a lot of time and, and there were all these administrative issues as well. Uh, they've sort of tried to exempt a lot of uh, uh, projects from uh, hardcore environmental impact assessment report requirements. Uh, they've actually classified them and categorized them in, 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 in three different categories uh, based on, on the level of impact that the government feels that uh, the particular project will have. Uh, another thing what the government has also done is that uh, they have brought in this 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 uh, this uh, uh, provision for post facto approvals, uh, a provision for compounding of, of previous penalties, uh, whereby depending on the penalty and depending on the impact on the environment that there is, uh, uh, the, 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 the investor, the industry player can actually compound the offenses and, and, and move forward with the projects. I think so the, the government has taken a very pro-development stance, uh, if I may. Uh, there have been a lot of re relaxations of, of the requirements. Obviously, there are pros and cons of them, but I think the key takeaway is that they are looking to, to reduce the burden of doing business in India uh, uh, and also the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the primary issues of, of delays of red tapeism that is there. So it's, it's a very pro-industry sort of a move, Akila. Okay, okay. So that's good to, good to know. So basically, it will improve the ease of doing business in India as far as, uh, you know, manufacturing uh, and the like mining and stuff are concerned correct uh, and and what about the other flip side so you know whilst uh, this is a very important piece of legislation uh, further relaxations or liberalization may not be seen uh, in the same manner by everybody uh, especially the environmental lobby uh, what would be the take of uh, say funding agencies or multilateral bodies uh, if this was supposed to be law does that uh, you know affect their assessment and and the like 
Yes, uh, that's a good question, Akila. One of the biggest uh, cons of, of these, this, these new norms is that they have reduced the, the level of public interaction that is required. Uh, now, the thing is that the, the undertaking of an environment impact assessment report, a minimum and requirement is to ensure that there is a there are social safeguards and there are safeguards for the environment, the impact on the environment is, is taken care of. Now, obviously, opinion of the public is, 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 is a very integral part of that. What these new norms do is they are in a way reducing that interaction with the government, with the public. So I think that is one of the biggest issues that there is because uh, proper public dialogue is very important. Now, how does that translate into an issue? Uh, Reserve is, uh, you know, funding by, by global organizations. So for example, the World Bank, you know, the World Bank has very stringent requirements of, of what an EIA has to be. One of those requirements is that for an, for, for an EIA report to be effective, there has to be public consultation. Now, obviously, these new norms reduce that. Now, obviously, the World Bank is going to have its own set of norms which they would want to follow. Now, if supposing our norms do not have effective public consultation processes, one, uh, or uh, for that matter, even if any of our norms are, are against the UNCCC uh, provisions, the, the uh, against the provisions of the Paris Treaty, uh for climate change then definitely there's going to be an issue so i think it's it's go, it's only going to be a question of time uh, you know only time will sort of tell how these new norms will come into play but i can definitely foresee some issue that the world bank may have especially on the with regard to the reduced public interaction uh reduce objections of of people who will be impacted as a result of these projects so definitely that would be one of the biggest issues okay thank you so much for that I think that brings us to the end of our, uh, you know, uh, nuggets on corporate law, environmental law, and uh, employment-related matters. Uh, if there are any specific questions on these topics, then uh, we'll be very happy to take them. Uh, if there aren't, then uh, you know there are some questions which are a little off-topic, which we can take it up in writing separately. You can post your questions on the on the chat. Okay, so uh, we take it that there are no further questions. Uh, thank you so much uh, for a patient hearing. Uh, thank you, Monas and IGCC for this opportunity. We enjoyed having this discussion. Uh, in case you have any further questions or you require any updates, feel free to get in touch with us. You know, uh, you know how to get in touch with us. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ashwin, Rashmi, Monas. Can't see thank Monaz. You. Thank you. Bye. Hello. Hello?